So we'll have a little lesson on the Round Battle Galliard by Dowland. Um, you can get the sheet music, there's a link for that underneath the video, um, but you can watch the video for free and just pick up tips um, and ideas about playing Dowland. So a couple of things, of course I, I played it twice there, um, once without the capo, once with the capo. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second, but of course we're tuned in relative loop tuning, so that's just tuning the third string to F sharp. So if you're in regular tuning, then your G's are matched. But you just want to match it to the F sharp. So you're going to lower it a little bit. And then check, I like to check my A's. So third fret now. At the sheet music page is another video that talks about um, all about relative uh, loot tuning, so you can check that out. But at the moment, all you need to know is you need to tune the third string down to F sharp. And that way all those F-sharps are open, and that's the way that Dallin's um, instrument would have been tuned. And then it's up to you if you want to, if you put the capo on the third fret, it kind of offers um, a little bit lighter of a texture, um, puts it in the same key, into the same key as a lute, relatively speaking. And so now you're very similar to a lute. It brings the register up on everything, so everything sounds a little bit higher, um, a little bit lighter maybe. But it also equalizes the sound. Instead of the, the hard nut here um, creating the break for the strings, you have a fret. So all the notes sound a little bit equalized. Your, your open strings sound very similar to your closed strings. So that's what that's all about. You can feel free to ignore the capo, but um, this music is, is definitely much easier to play with the, um, with the F sharp tuning. 
Um, not too much to say, just make sure you have a nice sense of the pulse, right? Just like always a kind of a, like a light bounce for this Renaissance feel. Um, sustain chords with a certain amount of touch, you know. But there can be a little bit of a lift to them. So you don't have to be like one like ultra legato, but it, it's different. You want a certain amount of sustain from each chord. Um, but also a little bit of lift because there's a lot of big chords that you have to kind of change and jump into. So if you have a consistent articulation on those chords, you know, just a certain amount of sustain. Especially those things, it's, it's really tough because the fingers just have to jump around. There's no, there's no trick to it. They, just, they really have to jump around a lot. Um, but if you articulate it in that way, it makes the playing easier, but also contributes to the overall articulation um, and aesthetic that you have for the piece. And you can listen to lots of lute players for more ideas on that. They're going to do a lot more in that regard than I'm doing. So um, besides that, um, you just go through and you follow the fingerings and um, make sure you play it with a metronome every once in a while just to make sure that your sense of pulse is, is indeed steady. But then at the beginning and ends of phrases, just like taper the phrase a little bit. All of this stuff, you know, you don't want it to be too strong at the end. You want, the, you want some tapering to happen, right? You know, a little bit of... of coming down at the ends. Same thing elsewhere in the piece. Really, it usually the piece, the phrase kind of ends right on the first beat of that final bar. Um, and then there's some like trailing material that happens afterwards. But it's all just kind of chord um, sustain kind of stuff. It's just like flowing by after the end of the phrase. So don't don't make a big deal of it. Just kind of taper it out and use it as like a relaxing point in the music before you start the next phrase. So each time, you can kind of like start the phrase again. Um, as always, um, you can play the melody on its own. Some, like trailing material that that sometimes happens with scale passages that isn't quite as melodic um, as other times. Um, we'll do a walk through the piece but in terms of right hand fingering there's so many big chords that don't worry about repeating fingers too much you'll, you'll have to repeat some fingers. Um, I, whenever there's a scale passage of course um, I'm alternating I am mainly maybe throwing in the occasional A but with all those chords you're gonna have to repeat some fingers. The only part that I'd be very specific about is the opening. I would start with P, I, M, do the A finger for the F sharp, do a, do a slur in the left hand, sorry, I, M, and then repeat I, M on those um, repeated notes. So like I, M, followed by A, and then I, M, I, M, I, M. That feels best to me. Um, you can experiment with other fingerings if you like, though. So we'll just do a walk through the piece now. I'll go quite a bit slower. So on these five note chords, um, Dowland, um, I asked Doug Hensley about this actually, um, a lute player in the area, and um, sometimes they would sweep their thumb or sweep the whole chord. But other times they would actually use the I finger because loop players play a little bit differently. They would actually sweep their I finger over multiple notes. Um, that's kind of impractical on the modern guitar, especially with the way that we sit. So I'm sweeping the thumb over multiple bass notes. So whenever you have a five note chord, get your fingers on the top couple of strings and then you'll sweep your thumb over whatever chords are needed. But don't worry about it too much. The chords, there's lots of repeated notes in these chords. So it's not a huge concern. And then, that's a pretty tough one, but you just have to know the shapes and articulate it, like I said before.
pretty straightforward. Next section. Some of that spacing is a little bit odd, but I am I'm plucking all those, so it's P I M A. There's no secret to some of these jumps, you just have to jump and know the chord shapes. The open F sharp is so helpful in this section. Without it, this piece is pretty tough. There'd be lots of bar A involved. With the open F sharp, there's barely any, so um, it really does, the relative loop tuning really does help. Last section. Dowland actually closes the E there. But that makes the jump to the next chord um, a little bit tricky. Like you could close the first E and then open string the, the next E, but for a consistent texture, I just went with an open string so that you have that open string to get this B7 chord down here, right? So um, you could finger it like Dowland though. It's just a little tough. Um, so utilize that open string if you like. Um, you can use your third finger or your fourth finger on that G. Sometimes it's good, like the third finger will allow you to like use it that string as a guide finger, but also the fourth finger is kind of like a memory of what comes next, so I don't mind using either finger there. In the original, Dowland has a lot of ornamentation symbols, like kind of scattered like all over this score. So feel free to add in little trills. All my little trills that I'm adding, I didn't do much in terms of ornamentation. Like sometimes um, loop players will even connect lines by creating scale passages and all sorts of variation work. Um, I just added a few like trills. So from the primary note and then just trilling to the note above. Um, I, that adds some decoration to the score. So besides that, um, just to recap all of that, um, Nice kind of Galliard like dance, so just like a 3-4 dance feel, kind of light, articulated in a slightly detached but very sustained way as well. So sustained that it'll have the appearance of legato, but not so much that it's going to make it insanely difficult to play. Um, and then outside of that, um, play the melody a little bit or just know what melodic passages you want to bring out. It's mainly the upper voice though, it's usually pretty lyrical. And then just go through, you have to know the chord shapes really well to play this piece because there's lots of jumping. <laughs>